Hello, everybody. My name is Marlon, and today, as part of the ENM 2020 course, I'm going to talk about um, niche comparisons, a little bit more on niche comparisons in environmental space. Last week, a lot of questions were about the Hutchinson and duality, or the Hutchinson's duality. And because of that, I want to give some more ideas on this topic. So in this plot, in the first part, you have the geographic, um, let me do this, okay. So you have the geographic representation of America. And in this case, um, I have plotted here all the points in the center of a grid of 10 minute resolution. Okay, so each point is unique. There's only one point in each place here in the continent. And the corresponding environmental dimension of this point expressed in two variables is here. And as you can see, it's a very regular shape and it has the particularity that uh, it doesn't have a unique position for each point. They are not like this ones in which each point occupies a specific space here, and it's only for that point, not here. You can have multiple points, one on top of the other, or very close to each other, compared to other areas in which points are very scarce, they are not too dense. And you actually can see that in this kernel density plot. So this area here has very low density compared to this area here, the brighter one. And this one is a one with highest density all this area. So there are a lot of points here with very similar conditions here. And there are fewer points towards these areas. The darker areas here have lower densities as well. Okay. And the importance of this is that that uh, correspondence between a point in environmental space and geographic space helps us to do two things. First, we have occurrences and we have layers that we can see in geographic space. But that we uh, use in environmental space to create ecological niche models because we're extracting those values in those records. And for that, specific calibration area. That's actually here where everything happens, when we, where we construct models to represent those niches. And those niches can be uh, more like simpler shapes than the ones that you see with the points. And those shapes or those volumes can contain a lot of points that are not necessarily only the ones that are here in the calibration region, but because one point from this region and one point from this region can be very similar, they can be very close to each other here. And then when you do a model and you represent it back into the geographic space, if it's only two in the calibration area, you will have predictions here, but usually you project that to larger areas. And in this case, for instance, you will have predictions here as well. Let's see that here. So look in this left top part, you have blocks in geographic space that are rep have representations in the environmental space. And here in this other one, you have environmental blocks represented later in geographic space. Those are the same points exactly. They exactly correspond to the ones <coughs> that are marked in blue in both spaces. So in this one, you see that despite having very big blocks, an area in environmental space can be very small. And then despite having very small areas marked in geographic space, you can also have very large representations in environmental space. That tells you a lot about how heterogeneous are environments in environmental conditions in certain 
sorry, how heterogeneous are certain geographic areas regarding environmental conditions. And it gives you an idea of how B can be a niche that is characterized with points that are here in these very heterogeneous areas or here in more homogeneous areas. Okay. And then we see this. It has this one has is representing the potential implications of the transfers of ecological niche models. So think about that block. So that block, let's assume it's a model of ecological niche of a species. It's a very simple block, like something like a bioclean will do. And then if you see the block has a very constrained shape, it's it's constrained to just one area here in environmental space. When we, but when you see that in geographic space, it has representations all over America sometimes. And look, it can be very disjunct and it can be very large in terms of area because it can be in a denser area or it can be just few points when it's in a, an area with low density of points here. So those those kind of ideas, those kind of like the implications of the Hutchinson's duality, uh, you have to have them in mind when you're working with ecological niche modeling, in like in all the type all types of analysis that you can think of, in overlap analysis and transfer analysis stuff like that. So have this in mind, and actually let's talk about more implications in the next slide. Uh, here we're seeing again the duality. In the left part we have the environmental space and in this part we have a very, uh, a, a, an oversimplification of what's the geographic space and its components. And it's actually the band diagram that you should know already. And this simplification is very good to understand this duality. So this is geographic space. It's a geographic area, big one. And you have a species. And that species is distributed in a place where uh, it has access to, a place that the species has access to, and a place that contains suitable conditions, and a place that has uh, positive biotic interactions for the species. And that's this area, right? So A is the set of geographic areas that present suitable environmental conditions. B are the areas that present positive biological interactions. And M are the areas that are actually accessible to the species. Okay, and that you can see here as well. So G are all are represent is represented with all these uh, gray points plus the black ones. The black ones that are species occurrence records but in environmental space. Okay. And A is here. A is here representing the fundamental niche which is the complete set of environmental conditions that the species can survive on or where the species can maintain populations without uh, immigration or immigrational events. And then you have M, which is the set of environmental conditions that are accessible for the species. And you also have B, which are in this case, the set of environmental conditions where positive biological interactions are found. So that restricts, as you can see, where the species is in environmental dimensions. And that happens as well here. <clears throat> that region that is the intersection of the three things is also here. And of course, this, this are simplistic, simple, the simplest ways to see these relationships. <clears throat> but these ideas are important when you're thinking about 
ecological niche modeling, ecological niche characterization, and comparisons. And the region of overlap of these three main things is that one, and also has its uh, equivalent here. And those are the environmental conditions where the three conditions, uh, uh, environmental conditions where the three components uh, overlap the biotic set of conditions that are good, positive biological interactions and available or uh, available set of areas and conditions, okay? So why it's important to see these three things inside the G space and inside the E space because that allows you to see the fundamental niche, which is here in green, uh, the realized niche, which is the intersection of the three components, which is uh, very, very close to where the species actually is. And then also it allows you to see the existing fundamental niche in some sense, because as you can see here, the gray points are not here or here or here or here, because those set of conditions they do not exist right now in the earth. Why? Because like, that's the way it is. The earth doesn't have all the environments in all periods of time. Uh, those are limitations derived from geological and geographic and climatic characteristics and phenomena. And so the fundamental niche is reduced to this area here, which is the one that actually exists, sorry, this one here, the one that actually exists and is part of, of the fundamental niche. So these three types of niches are important to consider when you're doing these exercises because it's not the same to compare uh, a model of something close to the existing fundamental niche or a kernel density that actually will do something more like something closer to the realized niche. And let's see that in this slide. So here you have a kernel density of points. Those points here are the same than these ones here. So in this case, the kernel density is telling us almost exactly where the species is, right? In terms of environmental conditions. Remember, this is environmental space. Sorry for not clarifying that first. And it's actually telling us where the species is found. And then that is closer to the realized niche. I think I said that wrong before, but that's closer to the realized niche. And it actually has a high accuracy considering the known points. But remember that uh, there are some limitations. Uh, you not always know all the points for a species. Uh, there are a lot of unsampled places. And if you find later a point or some points that are in a different place here, this kernel will change. So the actual realized niche is not this one. It will be something that is perfectly reconstructing where the species is. In perfect things, they kind of don't exist in biology. And here, or ecology. Here, you have a model based on the points. And the model is an ellipsoid, it's a convex shape, trying to tell us what is best for the species and what is not as optimum for the species here in the limit, which will be the limit of suitability. And as you can see, there are a lot of empty places, like places that do not actually have points. That's because of the way this model categorizes or characterizes the niche, having the center where, like the center of the points is, and then a covariance matrix characterizing the variability of the points in the environmental space, it will recreate this shape. Now, is this ellipsoid the fundamental niche? Probably not. Probably something close to the existing fundamental niche, but still, 
we don't know, right? It's a model. And no model will be perfect in characterizing either the fundamental niche or the existing fundamental niche. Okay, and probably we can learn from physiological data, but extrapolating from physiological data to or macroecological data, uh, it's something that also that's also challenging. So there's uncertainty in the accuracy of this model considering the fundamental niche. Okay, and we always have that. But again, you may want to compare niches considering the something closer to the realized niche, or you may want to compare niches considering something like more like a convex model of the niche of the species. And as I said, that's challenging. Any of those options is challenging and it's challenging for a lot of reasons. And one of those reasons is the relationship between what's available for the species and what's actually used by the species. And also because of the variables that we have to use, which variables are actually better for representing niches of the species, either the realized niche or the closer to the existing fundamental niche or the models. And here you have an example. You have multiple variables with distinct levels of correlation. And you have points and you have available environments in blue. And so you can see the relationship between those two things. And if you do the kernel density of points, uh, you will have something like this. And then you will compare this niche against another using these two dimensions. But what about using these ones? Look, these ones. Imagine comparing those niches. Or otherwise, imagine comparing these ones. Which ones is, which ones, which dimensions are best? Actually, I, I don't really know. Which ones are better for doing our analysis? I don't have a clear criterion on which ones are best. But I know that you have to explore, you have to see how this look like how these variables, how this, the niches that you want to reconstruct look like in environmental space, and then proceed to compare the niches. Because comparing this niche in these dimensions against another, depending on how the available environmental conditions are for the other species or for the other group of populations for this same species, you may probably find different results using this ones or this ones this dimensions, I meant. Um, and so this challenge, it's like it's difficult to face, but it needs to be done. And it's to be done based on like responsible criteria. And you have to be able to defend your decisions when you're doing it, okay? And of course, we know that usually we avoid like this kind of highly correlated variables with values of correlation of almost one, right? Now, we also have a challenge when we are modeling niches because the model needs to represent something better than the realized niche in terms of what the species likes, right? Because the realized niche is affected by mobility, it's affected by, uh, I mean, uh, accessible areas with that, it's affected by biological interactions and for like it's affected by a lot of things. And then we, we make want a model of that, something that is simpler, but it's better in terms of characterizing all suitable conditions because you want to see how that model helps you to identify areas in other places that are suitable for the species, for instance. And so we have these kind of like scenarios. Let's assume the blue thing here, going from light blue to dark blue, is the accessible area for the species. And then you have the points for the species, occurrence points. And if you have something like this, you know that these areas are accessible, 
and you kind of know that the species has been well sampled across this area, you have a very clear idea of what is good for the species, at least what is what are the limits for the species, right? And then this simple model just very well to what will be something very close to the fundamental nature of the species. The question is how often it happens. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not it's not that often. Same thing here, but I just want to uh, represent that the density of points in the accessible areas, how they are, it matters. And in this case, for instance, all areas inside the model, inside the ellipsoid niche that are in darker blue colors, those are indications that the geographic projection of this niche will be broader than those in areas where the color blue of the background is lighter. Why? Because this means those kind of environments are more common in the geographic area that is accessible to the species. Then we can also have cases like this one. We have a model based on points and the model is like this because we have a high concentration of points here, which is the centroid. And then the concentration or density of points reduces towards the edges of this ellipsoid, both sides. And there's no clear limit here. So this kind of like indicates something that something like this model will fit the niche of this species. And same happens here. The only difference is depending on the background, this model will have very like uh, narrower areas compared to this one because of the same reason explained here based on the density of points in the accessible area. Okay, but now let's see these examples. How do you know that this model is good? You don't know. You have a lot of, like, you have a denser concentration of, denser uh, concentration of points here, and that reduces toward this edge and then you don't have information here. It's not accessible to the species. Actually, the species kind of prefers environments that are not so common and that are at the limits of the environmental, the environmental conditions that are available in the accessible area. So whether this model fits well this, this scenario or this species, it's a little bit uncertain. At least you have a denser, very clear, dense cloud of points here. So you kind of like know this could be the center, right? Well, yeah, but yeah, you are not sure. Because if you have if you have more available environments here, it may be the case that this, yes, it's kind of dense, but here it's denser. So the, the centroid of the ellipsoid will move towards this area. And then, of course, the limit will increase that way. Okay, both ways, actually, depending on the type of ellipse. Okay, so this is important. How do you know a model fits well? Well, if you explore the environmental space, you probably have an idea whether your model fits well or has a lot of uncertainty. And unfortunately, these cases are not so uncommon in our field. This is happening a lot of times, actually. And same thing here. Uh, the only difference is that the environments that the species prefers are actually not, like they are not uncommon in the accessible area. And that I'm showing you this kind of both cases because later I'm going to tell you what that means in terms of comparing niches, like having something that is very common in terms of environmental conditions in an area, okay? And then you have these other cases in which uh, you do find a difference. 
So you have this kind of cloud of points. You have a clear centroid here. You have you have sampled very well this species. And look, this uh, tail here is very long. This one is short, but you see the same pattern. You see decreasing density here, decreasing density toward this edge. And the other interesting thing is that here, these environments are actually very common in the accessible area, but still the species is not there. Even though being so common, these environments are not kind of, like, species kind of don't like these areas. And that is an interesting uh, finding because that says the normal ellipsoid won't fit very well there. The centroid fits and the centroid has a kind of a implications because there is an entire set of ideas that propose that the centroid of the ellipsoids, the centroid of environmental conditions used by the species are indicators of where the species is more abundant. So kind of like the centroid shouldn't have to move from here. But this model, the simple ellipsoid model, doesn't fit very well this data. Then you have to see other options. There are other options of ellipsoids. There are other options of types of models that you can use. But this is important to see. Uh, it doesn't have to be symmetrical the way a species likes temperature. For instance, if a species likes a lot, 27 degrees of temperature, it doesn't have to be the tail that goes towards colder conditions doesn't have to be the same shape that you see towards warmer conditions. And why? Because like imagine being at 50 degrees, which is only kind of 23 degrees from 27. And then the same tail will be 23 degrees from, from 27 towards colder areas and that will be uh, four, de four degrees. Celsius. There are some species that actually can live, that can actually live in those conditions, but let's imagine just 10 degrees. So 10 degrees is uh, good for a lot of species. It's not optimal for this species at 27. And then that is 17 degrees from 27. Then let's sum 27 plus uh, 17 and you have 44, right, I think. So 44, it's actually a lot of temperature. That is something that not many species will like to live in. So the, assuming that, that the tolerance of a species have to be the same towards warmer or colder conditions or towards drier or, and wettest conditions, um, it's it's a big assumption. So sometimes models like this one will fit better. But what happened here? What happened here is a little bit more complicated because in this region you have very scarce environments. So you may probably not see the species there just because they are so scarce that species never touch them, never goes there, but it goes. So, uh, like, it goes there, but it never gets registered, something like that. So, this is even another layer of complications that you have to face when doing the modeling, right? And why I'm talking about all of this? It's because you have to use models to do niche comparisons if you want to use models, of course. And we saw already the complications with uh, representations of kind of realized niche and so that takes me to the ideas of statistical significance in comparisons of ecological niches and it's it's i have been talking about available conditions before and this is actually what i want what i want to talk about here because uh, let's see these two kernel densities based on occurrences. So this will be something close to the real life niche for one species and this one for another. And same thing here for these two. 
But in this case, you see an overlap, right? But how do you know that overlap is not just by chance? And what I mean by chance is that well, it's just they are in the same region. They are there, they're, the environmental conditions accessible for one species are very, very similar to the ones for the other species, like this. Look how, how similar are the accessible conditions for one species and the other. And look here, they are not similar at all. They not even touch each other. So what will be the value of overlap for these two niches? Zero, right? And the value of overlap for these two ones, let's say 0 0.2, so 0 0.3, something like that. Now, let's think just in available conditions, okay? And let's think in statistical significance. This is not directly the way in which other, in, the, in which like EcoSpat does things, but it's basically the same principle. So let's talk about it. You have a region that is has denser condition, denser points here. This is a kernel, so this area has more points than this one. And same thing happens with the blue one. It, it has more points here than here. That means that if I do a random sample, most of the points are going to be here just by chance. And same thing happens here. So if most of the points when I do a random sample are here, and most of the points are when I do a random sample here, and I create a, a kernel density for these ones and a kernel density for these other ones, the values of overlap are going to be kind of high, right? And let's do the same here. I'll do sampling here, right? More density here, more density. And the values of overlap from random points will be always zero, right? Because they, they will never overlap because they just don't overlap. So remember, those are the niches. If I say this overlap is larger than this one, am I saying something correctly? Well, yes, in principle, this, this overlap, they, they don't. But is that significant? Is that relevant? Uh, actually, no, because here you cannot have overlap, even if you want. You have no idea what will happen if this species has accessibility to these areas. You have no idea what, what, what will be the scenario. And in this case, you do have an idea. And you saw that a lot of times the overlap like that you can recover with random points is even larger than this ones. So imagine statistical significant tests done by uh, random sampling backgrounds. You will have, let's say 100 times done the random sampling here, random sampling here and comparisons of kernels. If those random sampling will uh, point uh, processes give you a value of overlap for each time, then you have a, histogram of frequencies. Then the value of overlap, the observed one was uh, 0 0.3, I think I did, I said. But if your values of overlap derived from random sampling are always above that value, then you reject the null hypothesis based on how these things are done, right? If your observed value is more extreme, or as extreme as the lowest confidence limit, 0 0.5, 0 0.05 of the null distribution, then you'd reject the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is that the niches overlap. So with this example, you rejected the null hypothesis of niche overlap, and you're saying even though they overlap, they are different enough to say that they don't. And then in this case, the initial value of the observed but the value of overlap is zero. But because of the random sampling here and because of the random sampling here and the null distribution that you will get will, will always be zero, then your value of overlap is gonna be zero compared to the other ones. 
but it's going to be in the same line that all other values of overlap, zero. So your value of overlap is not different than random expectations, okay? And that means that you cannot reject the null hypothesis of overlap, even though they don't overlap, okay? And, and that, that is, it's very interesting and EcoSpot does that very, very well, I guess. Uh, I have seen those kind of examples and I like that because you cannot talk about overlap if the accessible environments do not overlap at all, okay? So let's just not say that these don't overlap. Let's say that you don't have any evidence to say that they do not overlap. And that also happens with models. And the way we're doing it here is with ellipsoid models, because you know that I like them, but also because they are simple to explain. And again, sorry, let's say, let's talk about the overlap. Here, the overlap, it's kind of like more or less good, not that bad. So you have an overlap of 0 0.25 or something. Like here is very peripheric, right? So here you have a 0 0.1 or something like that. So which value of overlap is larger? This one, I think, if my eyes are okay. So is that relevant? Is that safe to say? I think, I think that is not. Because if you have something like that, and it's very similar to what we had before, if you have something like that, you see that if you do random sampling in these ones, the ellipsoids that you can construct are always going to be most of the time here. Sometimes someone, some ellipsoids will be here. But most of the time are going to be here. And for these ones as well, like most of the time are going to be here, kind of here, sometimes here. But because of density of points, they're always going to be in these darker areas. Same thing is going to happen here. But in this case, most of the time, the ellipsoids that you can recover from random sampling here are going to overlap these ones here, the ones that you can reconstruct from here. And actually, they're going to overlap a lot, more than what we were seeing. And here, you have a lot of ellipsoids here, a few will be here, like some will be here, but a lot will be here, here, very few here, some here, and they, they are not going to overlap too often, right? Because accessibility doesn't allow them to go farther in, each, in either of the directions. So again, if you do the significant test analysis, Let's say here you observe value 0 0.2, but the values that you can obtain from overlapping random ellipsoids are going to be probably always higher than that. And again, you are going to reject the null hypothesis of overlap, even though these ones overlap more than these ones. And in here, your values of overlap are going to be most of the time, your value of overlap, the observed one, is going to be most of the time larger than the ones that you can obtain by randomly sampling these two guys. Okay, so in that case, your value overlap is going to be larger than the lower confidence limit of overlap values from your null distribution, and then you cannot reject the null hypothesis of overlap. And then here, you rejected the null hypothesis of overlap. Okay, and what, which, why is that? It's because of the available conditions. So that's the importance of availability of environmental conditions depending on accessible uh, geographic areas for your niche models and for your uh, analysis of niche overlap or niche comparisons, okay? So with that, I want to thank you and also thank uh, my mentors and Luis, my dear friend, and I'm going to show you now a video of how to use a libc or package with uh, an example of an 
Nature Lab Analysis.